Hi, and welcome to the Agri-Food Pioneers. We're here to give a voice to the companies in the agriculture and food industries, making a real difference to the environment. And today I'm joined by George Crossley, farm manager at Rushmere Farm. He's seen some progressive changes on his farm and has been invited onto this channel because of his farmland diversification, organic transition, and wildlife protection policies. Welcome, George. Thanks for joining us. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Hey, thanks very much for coming on. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's it seems like a lot has changed on your farm um, over the last few years, um, and you have diversified massively. Um, can you tell us how and why you did that? Um, so, as a family, we decided we wanted to to farm in a way farm alongside nature i guess um to farm to grow food in the in the way that that nature intended um so in order to do that um we wanted to diversify we needed to diversify um to to sort of manage the the risk of making the the change away from kind of conventional chemical farming um, I don't like that it's called conventional farming, but that's that's yeah. what most that's the way most farms are run using yeah, sure. systems. sort of intensive. Yeah. You mean in like intensive farming? Yeah, kind of thing you mean. Yeah, farming using high high inputs of fertilizer and other sure. chemicals. So one of the things I've done is is to start a business uh, making oat milk from the oats that we grow here organically on our farm. Um, and that's a that's a delicious, creamy, nutritious oat milk that goes out to to the people across the south from from Dorset up to to London. Um, and I guess the you know one of the, one of the things about that was I wanted to to have an oat milk available that was not tetra packed, so it was packaged in a recyclable, reusable um, bottle, but also as a means to talk about our farm and to get it out there and mm. so that people can can not just enjoy really good nutritious food but um maybe understand or maybe get drawn back to to the roots of of that and um and so i use that as a means to get people to come to the farm and and see what's going on if they can um so we also have a tourism business. So I, I started with a couple of yurts in a campsite and now um, I have, I've just finished building a couple of cottages in an old stable barn, um, which are completely powered by renewable energy. They look great. Um, and so people can come and stay and I do farm tours and we do workshops. Um, so that well i mean part of my agenda is to is to is to talk to people about the way we farm and and why farming um and nature are are not just nice but they're like essential sure um, and it's essential that they work together yeah couldn't agree more so I think what you're saying is you're it's it's a big risk to drop the amount of chemicals you use um and yeah. well well lose all the chemicals altogether um and to go organic like you have done um because you're not gonna be able to um you're not gonna be able to produce an, as much product as you once did um so you've had to diversify your farm to create other revenue streams to compensate for that is that kind of that's what you exactly found? right yeah yeah great well yeah. That, that makes perfect sense to me i'm sure everyone watching could can understand that um it seems like a a really smart thing to do is it is it a lot of extra work all the additional how much what about um setting up the oat milk business um is there a lot of infrastructure involved in that yeah so a, yeah I've, I've been working like a dog for two years um so yeah. I, don't know. I haven't had a break really um but i think it's worth it um yeah i mean there's a yeah a lot of extra stuff that we didn't have before so um we started actually buying in oats to make the oat milk so um 
we just had to buy the equipment to make the milk, which is basically a big tank and a, a big mixer and some some other kit for bottling. Um, and that's all on site, is it? All on site, yeah. And then had, I repurposed it, an old barn into a into a hygienic facility, which was a bit of a mission. I bet. Um, and yeah, and bought and bought lots of kit, which cost me a lot of money. Um, but I think it will pay off. Seems like um, a good market. Yeah, seems like yeah, and know, I think seems... so. And there's not there's not that much oat milk that's that's not in a tetra pack, um, and that is made in the UK as well. So um, yeah, sure. And that local short supply chain is kind of pretty important to me. Um, but yeah, so now we're now we're using more and more of our own oats in the milk. So that means I also have have invested in in grain processing equipment. So we have to turn oats into into oatmeal, basically. So that means cleaning and dehulling and milling and mm. all that extra stuff as well. So that's another challenge, but it's all good. It's all good fun. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> so you've got the whole process on on site now. Yeah. Amazing. That's that's huge, yeah. isn't it? In terms of um in sort of air miles and and you transport if you're actually growing the oats even if it's not all of the oats yourself processing them and turning them into oat milk i mean that's a that's a massive usp for you i bet there's not many people doing that yeah no it's it's yeah it's great and and it's amazing that we we're really lucky to have the possibility of doing that um and even yeah even our waste products are going so our waste you know the waste uh, the bran off the outside of the oats, which doesn't go into the milk in the end, um, is, is strained out, and we send that down the road to the cows um, of a local farmer. Um, and those cows are the same cows which are grazing our fields and and fertilising our fields. So fantastic, fantastic, so completely circular, which is beautiful. <laughs> that's great, and um, and it's nice to think that. The oat milk um, people who are, who are interested in in oat milk can actually collaborate with the dairy industry. Who <laughs> most people who drink oat milk seem to really have a aversion to all dairy. You know, it seems like they're the enemy. But I I don't see it like that. I just, you know, it seems to me like it's just another market. And they and are it's nice, yeah. nice to think that you're collaborating with them. Yeah, to some extent, we do. We do. Most, I mean, the cows that come on the farm are actually beef cattle. But um, oh right, okay. Um, I, I mean, it's a difficult conversation to have when you're selling oat milk. Definitely. Um, yeah, I'm sure. But, but uh, livestock is essential to to farming in this way. We can't if we don't have chemical fertilizer. It's extremely difficult to get enough fertility just with plants. We need. Yeah. We need livestock. Yeah, understood. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your um, workshops and the help you've been delivering to refugees. How did that come about, and how how does the how does that work? Is there a specific um, charity that you that you donate to? Yeah. So I guess to start a bit at the beginning, I I'm I've always been quite into woodworking and green woodworking we have a few areas of woodland on the farm um and more recently i've started working with a couple of woodworkers um in the area one guy who's now on site um and so we run courses in spoon making and um stools where you basically you start with a log and by the end of the day you've got a, a stool or a chair or a wow. um, um, or the end of a weekend, depending on what size the project is. Um, yeah. yeah, so people come down from you know all over the place to do those courses, and they stay in our accommodation, and we eat good food and have a nice time, drink lots of cups of tea, and um, then about well, ten percent of all the income from from those courses feeds into a pot, which we give to a charity called Friends Without Borders who are in Portsmouth. Um, so they're, they're a charity to, who help 
refugees, asylum seekers, and immigrants who most mostly at the stages where they're kind of out of the hands of the Home Office. So the Home Office has a bit of a habit of kind of dumping people. It mm-hmm. was with support. The system of support is actually pretty good. Um, but once it's decided that they either are or they're not allowed to stay, that's it. All support is gone. Any housing is gone. Any fun, any any funding is gone. Um, and so that's, that's where the charity comes in and, and looks after people, um, which is a massive challenge. And they need a lot of resource to do that. Mm. And what we give them is minimal in regard to what they need. But um, so we did that for many years. And then, um, and we also did, a, we run occasional events, feasts and things in the woods and mm. fun opportunities to raise money. Um, and then Sounds more great. recently we, we run, so in the last year we've been running um, a, a wood workshop for, for a group of refugee men um, from Portsmouth. And they come up every month on the last Friday of the month and we, we, you know, we, we make something out of wood and we eat good food and we chat and it's just a really nice opportunity for them to get away from what is pretty tough existence. Mm. Um, and I love it. It's like, it's my brilliant. Best day oh. of the month. They're like, <laughs> exactly, super, really? Yeah, uh, like super nice people, like often yeah. really, really educated, really tr- like well trained, but they just don't, they're just not allowed to work. Um, and so they're just horrendously bored. Um, oh, God. Um, and that they, seems yeah, such a look, waste, doesn't it? I mean, it's a horrendous waste, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and, and a lot of the time our, our taxes are actually going. To, to support them when you know they'd much rather be working mm. so it's um it seems like a kind of strange political system that we live absolutely in absolutely bizarre absolutely bizarre i can't even begin to make sense of that um but fair play well done um one question that just jumps out at me is i speak to a lot of i mean i run a video production company that is primarily focused on agriculture um and i speak to a lot of farmers over the course of that work and the one thing they're all universally short of is time and (laughs) and yet you're you're organizing feasts workshops for refugees accommodation it's it seems like a lot how do you find and and let's not even begin to talk about the oat milk business like how are you managing to find the time to do all these things well i knew so I've only I've been running the cafe for two years. I took over from my dad two years ago, um, and I had a nice cushy engineering job before that. But I worked <laughs> nine to five and had holidays, yeah. um, and I knew I knew it was going to be like you know a big job. Um, so I've, but I really wanted to do it. I, I feel I just you know I feel really passionately that um, that I have. Uh, well, as a as a farm, we have huge capacity to make a change. Not everyone mm-hmm. has has that opportunity, and I really wanted to make the most of it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm doing a lot, um, but hopefully, when these things kind of fit together and we 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 begin to turn a profit, then you know, I can have more more people around me who can who can help, and and I might mm. get. I might get a day off. <laughs> <laughs> well, you sound That's like you dream. certainly deserve one, George. <laughs> um, absolutely. Okay, thanks again. So subscribe now and click the bell so you're notified when we speak to more pioneers of the agri-food industry that are leading the way to a sustainable, low-carbon and regenerative future. Thanks for watching. Are you an agri-food pioneer? Get in touch now to arrange your interview.